Three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with The Magic Brad Show, and we got another episode of The Magic Show. It's all about magicians having fun, talking about magic and the things you can do, the things you can't do, the things that are impossible that we make happen. And his name is Chris, and the last name is Langdahl, right? Yep, that's right. Hey, just first like try, look at that. <laughs> See, it's like saying angle with a ooh. Mm. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Names are funny. My last name is Goodham, but if people know how to pronounce it, they don't know how to spell it. And if they know how to spell it, they can't pronounce it. What is it, G-O-D-U-M or something like that? See what I told you? It's G-U-D-I-M. G-U-D-I-M. So they pronounce it either Guidim or Gudim. But I don't know. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. It's Norwegian, for cripe sakes. Anyways, uh, we're going to be putting this up on YouTube. So if anybody is on my YouTube channel, if you'd give me a little subscribe. And if you want to push that little dingy bell so you get the notifications. And if you like what we talk about, give me a thumbs up. Would you, could you? Can I coax you? So, Chris, um, I don't do these real long because commodity is that space of time and sometimes people are stuck with all that kind of stuff, but it's really cool connecting with magicians. I started doing magic when I was like four or five years old and I did it full time through the 70s, 80s and 90s. Now I'm 63 years old and sort of semi-retired. Um, what got you into it? Did someone pull a quarter out of your ear? Uh, no, actually, I... <sighs> what's the best way that I could describe it? I saw an episode of Chris Angel Mind Freak on television. Okay. And my mom called me into her room and she goes, hey, that creepy guy's on television again. And it was the episode <laughs> where he was walking across the pool. And I saw the, the money that he had and the cars that he had and the women that he was hanging out with. And I decided I'm doing that for the rest of my life. So I went to the dollar store and I bought a Spengali deck. Uh -huh. And I, I taught myself how to do the Spengali deck. And that's when I found out that there was a magic shop about five or six towns away from me. So it was the only magic shop left in Connecticut. So I went down, looked around, turns out they gave lessons. So I took lessons for a little bit, you know, just the simple things, the, the beginning um, magic theory and all of that stuff, how to, you know, sleight of hand, you know, how to uh, glide, how to palm, all that stuff. Oh, um, and, 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 and sadly, the, uh, the, the guy who taught me, and I don't really talk anymore, he kind of went his own way, I went my way, but I've been basically teaching myself ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, moved out to New York City a few years ago, I, I performed, I taught myself how to street perform, how to hustle out there. So, and now I do mainly close-up magic at restaurants and bars, uh, uh, stage theater shows, corporate events, and I, I also do private parties. But it's, it's a lot of fun knowing where I started and where I am now and knowing the fact that, hey, I don't even know where I'm going to be in the next five years. Well, that's kind of how I did, I did it as a, as a hobby till I got into high school. Then I started actually making a little bit of money. And then when I graduated in 1975, people said, you should get a job. So I did. I got a job for oh. the uh, Noka County Parks Department. And then I got laid off. And I thought, where's my gold watch? I thought I had a job here. And... Uh, I just decided to be a full-time yeah, right. magician. And a lot of people, you know, you do the gigs and go, so what do you do for a real job? <laughs> I've heard that before. I can't yeah. tell you how many times people have told me to get, like my mother is like adamant on me finding something like nine to five, even though like when, before COVID started, I was making a very healthy amount of money. Um, and less Which hours. is why I laugh. It's, it's like, it's like, I laugh because people like, people look at me and they're like, Oh, you need to get a real job. And then, you know, I pull out a brand new phone and they're like, where'd you get that? I'm like playing with toys. But yes, I, I also was doing it in high school. I was actually bullied a lot in school. And it wasn't until I went to school and did the magic for all of the seniors. And when I became in with them, right. everybody else was like, Oh, okay. He's cool. <laughs> I know it's a magic to me is a very strange, the, the, the reason I like it so much is it's so different from everything else. Um, I'll agree. Like, like most other arts, you see what they're doing. The magic, it just looks you're, like you're putting a coin in your hand. So what? And it disappeared. You don't see what happened to make that appear that way. That's the, that's the hard part. It's all hidden. And um, right. I know we talked a little bit on TikTok, but uh, the whole thing about people exposing the secrets now. Some people think, well, it's, it's free on YouTube anyways. You can go to any library and get it. 
I'm talking about the spectator. You're ruining it for the spectator. And I, I relate it to giving someone a gift without wrapping it. it I, I, can the fun out of it. I can understand, but, but here, here's the way I look at it. <clears throat> um, if Curse Angel's uncle never pulled a coin out of his ear at that Christmas party and told him how to do it, we would not have Curse Angel. You know what I mean? I think it is okay to teach certain things. I think it's okay to teach very basic principles and magic because, I mean, let's face it. If, if you're not going to teach it, there's going to be somebody in the comment board exposing it anyway because they're either – they either they have nothing better – Huh? But they shouldn't. They shouldn't. Absolutely. I completely agree. It's gotten to the point like I, I, I post a video on TikTok, which, by the way, is a fantastic app. I had no I, – I didn't ever expect to I have I just got into it myself. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it, it's insane. Um, but, you know, it's like, all right, well, do I post this knowing that somebody's going to expose it or do I, do I just go out and teach it so that way the people who want to expose it don't get that satisfaction? You know what I mean? And in the meantime, there are other people who are maybe showing interest and they're like, ah, you know, I want to, I want to do something for the Christmas party this weekend. You know, maybe they stumble on a video and they see an easy tutorial on how to, you know, how to make a coin disappear, or how to rip a napkin in half and put it back together. And uh, that becomes like maybe their start, you know? So I, I think it's okay to teach things, but I feel like you got to pay for the good stuff. You well, know? Here's the, the difference is Chris Angel and his grandpa were one-on-one. -on -one. Whereas when you yes. do it on TikTok, it's you and 10,000 people. That's true. That's so it's, true. It's, and it's out to the masses. And that's what yeah, I... Yeah, but then again, I mean, I mean, Chris Angel taught magic on his show. I'm David Copperfield taught shouldn't stuff have. before. And they, sh and they shouldn't have. <laughs> Penn and Teller did too, I, and they shouldn't have. Yeah, well, Penn and Teller, I mean, they, they did that whole Mastercraft thing. And granted, I watched it, and I was blown away just by how smart Teller is, but... Then again, Penn and Teller, they, they kind of made a career out of exposing the magic tricks in yeah, a way. I mean, you know, Penn's a juggler, not a magician. Them. Yes, it's true. It's true. And well, I, I just kind of, I, I try and draw the line, but it's hard when you're doing stuff like the, the sucker torn restored napkin or the, the yeah. sucker silk to egg where you're exposing sort of a secret. But then oh, you one up on it. And I, I yeah. like the, the sucker stuff where you lead somebody down a path. And then like, as far as doing something and people making comments, exposing it, nobody knows if they're right. Right. That's just their theory well, of like, how it actually works. Well, that's, that's, that's like the two card Monty trick. Uh, the, the one that you, the street magic trick that David Blaine made really famous. I mean, there, there got to be a point where one of the guys that he's performing it for knows for a fact that David did like, did that extra switch with the aces and he's arguing with him. Oh, this ace is on top. This ace is on top. I'm telling you. And then he turns it over and they're two Queens. And then all of his friends around him are like, Oh, see, now you owe him an apology. You're making him look like an idiot. <laughs> um, yeah. Sucker tricks are great. I actually, the, the spot board that I did on TikTok, I open up all of my stage shows with that. And funny story about it is I did it for a uh, college in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And the person who hired me was sitting in the audience watching the show came up to me afterwards and was like that was a great show i was like thank you what'd you like about it she goes everything was great but that board in the beginning when you walked out onto that stage with a stupid little board i was like oh what did i pay for and then she proceeds to tell me but when you did the trick and you showed us all of those dots i knew i was going to get a good show <laughs> and i've opened up my show with that for 10 years now it's a, it's a great trick because once you think you got them, you throw them for a loop. Yeah, well, I remember uh, Mark Wilson did that, um, mm. the spot card, and I made Mark one up. Wilson. I didn't know how the, all the spots showed up, but mm -hmm. the, the, the three and the four thing, I could do that. Right. <laughs> well, so that's one, one of those things as a kid. You, can, you can basically draw the, the um, ungimmicked version on a piece of paper and do it for your friends. You know, yeah. That's what they think they're getting. And then you throw all those other dots on there and they're like, you know, <laughs> See, that's where I think in performance, I think it's okay to expose something like that because it leaps into something else. But when you're like, there's the two oh, yeah. Asian guys on TikTok that one guy does something, oh, the guy them. grabs it out of his hand. And, I hate them. And exposes it. And it's just them. mean. And it's almost and like, uh, you know, you're at the, the Christmas party with the family and the kids are sitting on Santa's lap and someone pulls down the beard and goes, look, it's dad. Yeah. You ruined it for the kids. 
Exactly. You see, and, and you would think that there would be a point in time where they would grow up and learn like, oh, okay, well, there's other people here who, who like this, so I'm not going to say anything. Because I get a lot of comments that, that tell me, hey, I figured it out, but I'm not going to say anything. And then they inbox me and they're like, is this how it's done? Some of the times they're right, some of the times they're wrong. But there's a lot of people, you know, who still, they try to keep the, you know, keep the magic alive. Um, I, uh, I, 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 I love Mark Wilson. I, that was actually one of the very first magic books I had ever bought. That big, thick one. Remember that thick magic book, The Course of Magic that he, yeah. that he released? My friend Larry Anderson uh, that, helped him write it. That, yep. Yep. That was. Remember that the was Jawdropper the series? Oh, yeah. That. I had those. I had the Tarbell series, and then I had another. Uh, I had another book just on rope magic. Jaw Droppers was me and Larry Anderson did that. Really? Yeah, I was spent a year no out way. in L.A. with Larry. It was a lot no of fun. No way. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. That's that's incredible. It, I'm gonna have to get my hands on that. It was basically um, Mark Wilson's Course of Magic and a lot of other stuff. We'd go to the castle and research stuff in the library, and we just tried to figure oh, out nice. things that we could do with ordinary items and. It was a the huge magic project. castle was a place I've always wanted to go to. Better hurry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, they're closing it down, aren't they? I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, because I saw something. I guess they're in trouble right now, and I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Oh, there's been some um, weird political stuff going on, and people. It's just, it's weird. I honestly thought they were going to close it down after the thing with Daryl. You'd think. You never know what's going on. The place is haunted now. <laughs> yeah well by two spirits because they say they say houdini haunted it for a while he probably still hangs out there oh I Vernon's probably it. in the corner too <laughs> he's probably you kidding me they probably have a secret speakeasy in the basement somewhere <laughs> exactly they're all still alive <laughs> yeah they, they they all went down a bit it's, it's like it's like the whole elvis theory elvis never died he just moved out to vegas where every other old guy is impersonating him so he can fit right in and nobody would yeah. know We've got a bunch of body doubles. <laughs> yeah. So what do you like working better? Do you like working the street stuff? Do you like working close-up parlor stuff? Do you like working the cor the corporate stand-up stuff? I love I love working corporate uh, corporate events and close-up events, uh, mainly because they mostly tie in. And I like it because you've got me, who is a you know, lower class hack from Mansonia, Connecticut. And I go down to Greenwich, Connecticut, which is one of the richest areas, probably the richest area in the country. Um, and I'm doing magic for all of these CEOs and millionaires and business owners and stuff. And I'm making them look like idiots in front of all of their friends, you know? And I mean, I'm not trying to say that I make them look like an idiot in a bad way. I, I say, you know, because I go to a lot of these events and they'll sit there and they'll start busting my balls. Oh, what are you going to do? You're going to shuffle the deck and pull a, pull a card out of my ear. And then I hit them with something crazy. And they're like, okay, this guy's got some talent. Um, there was a guy that I had met at a, at a bar in New York City. He was uh, he actually eventually hired me for his kid's birthday party. But he was from the Hamptons. <laughs> And he was sitting in a bar. I'm sitting on the other end of the bar, shuffling a pack of cards. And he calls me over and he's like, oh, that's really cool. You know, show me something. So I showed him a trick and I had him pull out a card. And then I pulled the card out of his jacket pocket. He would not leave me alone for like two hours, just trying to get me to tell him how I did the trick. He offered me 1500 bucks and I wouldn't crack just because I love the reaction but I gave him a business card I was like if you ever need me for anything call me and about a year later he called me he goes hey do you remember me I'm like depends he goes I'm that guy from the bar in New York I'm like all right yeah you're really jogging my memory <laughs> um and then he explained who he was and you know that was the guy who he, I pulled the card out of his jacket and it turned out he had a good but he had a good 65 70 people at his, at his mansion in the Hamptons and he's like come down uh, I'll pay you whatever you want. I'll pay for your travel. I'll pay for everything. I'll give you food, all that stuff. And it was a really good time. So I like the corporate stuff because I get to interact with, with people that I want to be around. Mm -hmm. I like stage magic because I, it, it allows me to, to show what I work on in the long run. And the best part is because you're on stage, you got the spotlights in your eyes. You can't see the audience. To me, I feel like that's my own little bubble. 
and I'll sure. stand there and I'll just perform for empty space. And the only thing I can hear is applause at the end of the show. Um, the only time that I would have to turn on the lights and see the actual crowd is when I'd bring an audience member up. But that's a lot of fun. I'm not a fan of birthday parties too much because of the fact that technology has gotten involved a lot with the with the younger generation. And it, there, it's at the point, if they see me doing a trick, they could take out their phone and go, boop, boop, revealed, you know? <laughs> um, but I, I, I would say... I, I taught myself how to market a while back. So I, I know where my market is. I know where my audience is and I know where I like to go. So I've got my places where I feel comfortable. Yeah. And uh, as you're talking there, my mind was going, of course. And the, the other thing that's really cool about the magic is it doesn't have to be something very complicated to yes, look like a miracle. Right. And then that person, like I'm assuming that somehow you, you made it appear as like you pulled that card out of that guy's jacket and he's going, yeah, how do I put this jacket on myself? How could he possibly have done that? But a and, fairly and simple technique can make you look yeah, like a miracle worker. That's the best part too. Psychologically, and you could do this with anything. I, I perform, I'm actually the gallery where I'm at now, right next door is the restaurant that I perform at on the weekends. And I was, I was doing uh, my, my gig over there. And there were these two women who came in and they you know, they're doing their thing, they're, they're eating, and I go over after they're done eating, and I offer to show them some magic, so I did two very simple things, but one of the things I did was the lipstick on the hand, which is a absolute go-to. I overheard these women later in the night at the bar talking, because that one of their friends came in, and I'm sitting on the other end of the, of the bar showing the, the, the other people at the other end of the bar some magic, and I can overhear them. This woman is going, he he had me hold out my hands like this, and then he went to the other end of the room, and my lipstick was sitting on the table closed the entire time, and he all he did was snap his fingers, and my lipstick appeared on my hand. And I'm like, that's not how the trick works, but if you're making me look that good, I'll accept it. <laughs> well, that's just it. They uh, play it in their mind. The magic happens yes. in the mind. Oh, absolutely. But it's never the effect that they actually saw. They oh, If they like it, they will always hype it up to be something better. Yep. And that's another reason I don't like people exposing stuff because it diminishes what actually is going on, the enjoyment that that person's having. The other thing cool about magic is it's global. It doesn't really oh, matter yeah. where you are in the world. It, uh, it's still applicable. It's and one of the very few arts where, where language isn't really needed. You know, you could, you could do, ma I've done magic for Chinese people who did not speak a word of English and I'm sitting there silent and they still like it because it's the visual effect. Totally true. And it's not really uh, bound by age either. It's eight to 80, you know, it's, uh, mm. but that's another thing that bothers me about the magic is people's brains immediately go into Johnny would like this. <laughs> yeah. Well, so would Harvey. <laughs> I, 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 and I and I think that's because you can find magic kits in the toys and games section at Walmart. Sure. Yeah, you know? jaw, we were guilty with that with jaw droppers. We we're trying to get it into the game section, and it probably. Oh, really? Themselves. Yeah. I mean, I, I, if it gets the word out, you got to do what you got to do. But I mean, I feel like if it's good, powerful magic, I, I feel like people should have to go and look for that. There's only two magic shops in in New York City that are you know that are relatively within my area because all of the shops here are closed i got to go down to manhattan there's tannins and there's phantasma and that's they sell the good stuff and there's a lot of things there like i there's there's books and you know old catalogs and stuff from the 1940s and 50s that they still have there and they always have the best magic in them it's like i feel if you're serious about it if you are if, like, if you do it for a living and you don't just want to hit them with self-working and sucker tricks, go look for the good stuff because you will find it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it ends up being the experience, like you've got a lot of experience in doing that lipstick thing. Um, you can take it and draw <laughs> that out and make yourself look like you know, a real miracle worker with something like oh, that. And the, the, other thing, the other thing that's great is the invisible deck. I've got an eight-minute oh. routine that I do with an invisible deck. Absolutely. Uh, 
always carry one too. <laughs> yeah. Good line. Oh, you got to carry your invisible deck with you. Uh, no, I always, I, I, I feel like there's the, you know, there's the simple way to perform something, but once you do it enough times, then you can add your own twist. You can add your own effects to it. You can literally turn a 30 second coin vanish into a five minute routine and really make them believe in what they're seeing. Sure. And I think it works absolutely best when you have an idea of what you're going to do. If you know how the trick is performed and it's something that you could borrow from an audience member. And if you want to start throwing in the scripting and things, you can get very creative and storytelling can implement into it and it can take your career to another whole nother level. Like do you yeah. aspire to be like, what's your future? Uh, are you looking to maybe be a magician comedian and be an actor in Hollywood or you want to maybe well, go into being uh, a David Copperfield? Do you want to work the trade show market? Well, I'm not Neil Patrick Harris. I can't act or sing. Um, but my ultimate life goal was to sell out Madison Square Garden. I, I have since kind of pulled back that goal because it's, let's face it, that's, that's, a, that's a huge like goal. Um, honestly, if I can make a living doing corporate, like shows at corporate events, theaters all over the country, and you know, maybe like restaurants and stuff, I would be content. I feel like one leads to another, you know, if you do a magic trick for somebody at a, at a restaurant and you hand them a business card, next thing you know, they're going to give that business card to their boss. Who's going to hire you for an IBM event or something. Totally does. Totally the, next does. Thing, the next thing you know, from there, IBM could be having some sort of a award ceremony at a big theater in New York city. And then they hire you for that because they liked you at their corporate party and you know, it ties into each other. And you know, also, um, go ahead. No, I, I also uh, keep in my, in the back of my head, you never know who you're going to meet. That's, that's a big thing. Oh, totally. I mean, if we knew the path, we could walk it, but oh, I've been true. an entrepreneur all my life and the entrepreneurial path is all over the place. You just never know what's going to happen. It's a roller coaster. Like, with jaw droppers, the way that happened was I was I had a business that I was running here in Minneapolis, and a friend of mine wanted me to come out to LA and help him with his martial arts events for years. And I said I can't. I'm running my business in Minneapolis, and my business in Minneapolis collapsed in 1998. So I said, oh, "What the hell am I going to do now?" So I was basically kind of homeless, living in a karate school in LA. I spent a year there, and then all of a sudden I get a call from Larry Anderson. He says, "Hey, you want to work on a project?" And I thought, "Sure." So who knows where it's going to take you? And uh, that now, out of curiosity, out of how did you meet him? How did you meet Larry? Yeah, he's from Minneapolis. Oh, so you so you know each you know each other all your lives then? Yeah, well, um, not all my lives. He's a lot older than I am. But um, Minneapolis consists of a lot of corporate. You know, there's Pillsbury is here. I believe and Target's Cameron. out there too. What's that? I believe Target is out there too. Oh, yeah, isn't it? Target Corporation, Medtronic, 3M, Honeywell, Mayo Clinic, uh, oh, wow. General Mills, Pillsbury. But Pillsbury, remember Mark Wilson did Pillsbury's Magic Circus. Yes. So Mark Wilson was yes. in town at the Eagle Magic Store, and that's how he met Larry Anderson. And Larry Anderson started working with Mark Wilson. Oh, okay. Okay. And Larry went out there and became an actor, and he's been on the Lucy Show and the Six Million Dollar Man. And then he started doing infomercials. With yeah. the George Foreman Grill, and they, they did uh, a Wall Magic was a painting comp painting thing from a Wagner painting here in Minneapolis, and the Wall Magic thing was funded partially by this guy that had an interest in magic. He's the one that financed the Jaw Droppers project. He says, okay. "Hey, can we do something with magic." They said, "Oh, what the hell? Yeah, let's do it." So huh. that's how it kind of sprung, and you you never plan that out. Never. <laughs> Never. And it's funny how things work. It's like, I, um, the, the amount of celebrities that I met by accident, it's crazy. Like I met Hugh Laurie as I was walking across from Bryant Park to go get a hot dog. And I recognized him and I recognized the cane he was using to walk with. And I'm like, I've got to take advantage of this now. Sure. Uh, 
<laughs> there's been a couple of instances. It's like I've met celebrities and didn't know they were celebrities until after they left. Well, when you're working those gigs and stuff, and all of a sudden you just bump into someone, I, I vanished coins in the hands of Dr. Ruth. Do you remember Dr. Ruth Westheimer? Doctor, that sounds, she sounds real familiar. It goes way back. Well, she was a sex doctor. She used to talk about having better sex, and she was German. That Dr. Ruth, okay. Yes. <laughs> but she was at an event that I was at, and uh, I met Bob Newhart, because he was the spokesperson for North, uh, Northwest Bank. Okay. Way back. So you end up bumping into these people, and I, I told Bob Newhart a joke, and he used it. I said, could I, could oh, I no say way. that I consulted you on that joke? He goes, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So That's you never great. know who you're going to bump into. And magic is, like I said, is a universal global thing. And it, it'll take you places. It'll get you Absolutely. on the stage. It'll get your foot in the door at uh, shows. It'll, it'll get you where you want to go, you know? Oh, it's, it, it, it's, it's definitely a unique art. And, you know, the amount, the amount that it's given me and the amount that I've gotten from it, uh, people wonder why I want to stick with it, you know? <laughs> That's why it bothers me that people expose the secret because it really diminishes the magic. It's almost like going to, you know, watch some of your favorite musician slay on the, the lead guitar and going up with a wire cutters and cutting all the strings off. Ah, geez. It's just That's not a good cool. way to get thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just not, or a concert pianist, and you go up and just take a ball peen hammer and smash all the keys. Yeah. It ruins the magic when you expose it like that. So that's why I think it should be teach in private, perform in public, and you work with a mentor or something and, and keep it kind of a tight thing. Because people, you know, people used to say, hey, it went up your sleeve. Because that little secret, they used to, magicians used to use their sleeves. So yeah. people go, hey, you just went up your sleeve. Now they'll say something like, oh, you're using one of those thumbs. <laughs> Or they, they know well, these gimmicks, the general public they, they does, do. they shouldn't. They do. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the major things that I, that I think ruined it too, and I, I don't know why they allowed it to happen, but the Magic Secrets Revealed show that they had on ABC a couple of years back that Val Valentino did, The Masked Magician, Yeah, that was... To me, that was the show that both killed the business and strengthened it at the same time. It because does if give you the think exposure, about it, but so does well, Mark Wilson. Well, yeah, but if you think about it, like it, it exposed so many magic tricks that you know we're we're talking like hundred year old tricks that nobody knew the secrets of until this guy came on. But at the same time, it also kind of forced all of these big guys out there to like jump their game up and create yeah. new things that nobody had ever seen before. That's kind of true, but I think that would be something they'd want to aspire to anyways. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's a, I, I, I've got the theory. There's only so many ways you could put a woman in a box and saw her in half, you know? Well, it used to be where they had the, the one that everybody knows it's two women. And then all of a sudden they used a thinner box. Then they used yeah. a clear box. Then they started doing with no box. Who was the one who did the clear box? That was the uh, Pendragons. The Pendragons, that's right. That's right, yeah, because yeah. they, also, they also did the, uh, the sub trunk in yeah. like, what, world record time or something like that? Yeah, they, they had the split that, curtain. Yeah, that was, that was a... So the magicians will up their game, I believe. They don't need to yeah. be uh, exposed. So well, it's like, part of my at, mission is to get people to quit doing that. <laughs> well, look at look at Penn and Teller. I saw Penn and Teller on Broadway sixteen times, and um, they have the one part of the trick where, ironically, it is where they saw the woman in half, and they bring you know they 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 bring the woman in, and they lay her in the table, and then they drop out the front end of the box, which shows like you know what it would look like if if they were you know laying in where the, the little indent was, the saw comes down. Yep. But at one point, like, Teller takes the stick out of the saw and it goes right through the woman's body. And you see that you actually, she's actually sawn in half. So it's like, it's, it's like a big sucker trick. They think, you think that you're learning something, but then that saw comes down and like, it slices the dummy thing in half. And then all of a sudden you see the boxes separate and then the curtain closes. And it's like, what did I just watch there? What happened? So, you know, something like that, I'm somewhat in favor of when you expose something and you one up it as the performance, but when yeah. you just expose it for the sake of exposing it and getting views and licks, like links and clicks, 
just so you can make ten thousand dollars a month on YouTube. <laughs> oh, I wish I could make ten thousand dollars a month on YouTube. I don't know how um, they're doing it. I'm an older guy. I don't get how they can get them uh, numbers up. I I had a partnership on YouTube at one point, and they changed all their policies and sliced me right up. They you know they cut me and probably about a hundred thousand other people because well we're not getting enough views. We're not making enough money. Um, the other ones though, that I really like are pickpockets. Those are guys where I think it's actually smart to expose that stuff because that way, if you're like in a big city, if you've ever seen a video where somebody teaches you how to take a wallet out of a pocket, I feel like if somebody knows how that's done, they can keep their stuff safer. Cause I actually have been pickpocketed in New York city. And luckily I, I know how to pickpocket. So I, I didn't track the guy down because he didn't, he only, all, the only thing he took was a deck of cards for me. Uh, cause I used to keep my, my wallet in my backpack and my cards in my back pocket. And because they were roughly the same size as, you know, as each other, they thought that they, that's what they took. Um, but this thing right here is about the same size as my wallet. Well, they took that thinking that it was my wallet. Um, but I felt the slightest little nudge in my back pocket as somebody was walking by and I check and I'm like, he just stole my cards. But because I had seen Bob Arno on television probably two, three years prior to that, and he explained how, you know, misdirection happens and how people will use physical uh, bumps almost, they're almost like PK touches if you think about it. Yeah. Uh, and they will, they'll touch you in certain ways and they'll like just rub up against you ever like nonchalantly. And half of your stuff is gone. And I just happened to know that. And I kept that in the back of my mind. And I'm like, all right, well, this is where I have to keep the stuff now. This is what I got to keep on me. So that way, if that ever happens again, I'm safe. So I feel like if I had never known that, I probably would have lost a lot more than just a pack of cards. Well, somewhat. Um, we had a pickpocket situation, me and my friend David Stahl. And he works, uh, does trade show work. And uh, we were in Brazil. And we're just walking along the sidewalk and two girls come up and go, cigarette? And they go, no, we don't smoke. And they go, sex? And they come up and they start hugging on him and putting his, their hands around him and stuff. And then also, and he had his hands in his pocket on his money clip. Mm -hmm. But they had the ability to stick their hands around and got his hand to come out. And there was two of them. One went in, there was the other one went uh, out. They jumped in the cab and they're like gone. But we're both magicians. We're savvy to that stuff. But still, mm -hmm. when the situation is about good looking girls and cigarettes and alcohol and sex, you don't Take think your mind right off of it. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's tough to protect yourself against stuff you don't know what's going down. That's the other thing that's cool about magic is uh, you, you can lead somebody down this path and do something over here and there's no way they can catch exactly. it. Well, that's, you know, it's the psychology. If I tell you to look at my hand, you're going to look at my hand because I looked at my hand and then all of a sudden I could pull something out over here and you would never know. Yep. That's psychology very is true. Thing. Psychology is a great thing. Oh, it totally is. Once you get going, you don't need to do the actual sleight of hand manipulation. You just have to go through the gestures and people will just follow with it. Like, you know, what? Sylvester, the jester. Sylvester, the jester. Never heard of him. He does, does the Sylvester pitch where he's producing coins and he's actually sort of juggling. He's producing these coins. Then he produces this big giant nut. And really? you, just, you don't see it go through the air because you're looking at the other coin going back <laughs> the other hand. So you see this coin, but you don't see the big nut fly through the air. It's just bizarre because the nut is five inches in diameter. The coin is just like two inches in diameter. Wow. See, but you I, don't uh, see I it remember... because of psychology. I remember hearing Harry Blackstone used to say, I can make an elephant appear on stage right in front of you guys and you would never know it. And he would literally go down to the corner of the stage and do like a, a flower routine. And all the while the crew was pulling the elephant onto the center of the stage and nobody sees him do it. <laughs> yeah, have you seen some of those guys that do like changing their shirts and stuff? Yes, yes. The pickpocket, who's that guy, uh, the pickpocket that's... There's Bob Arno and then there's Apollo Robbins. Apollo Robbins. Yes. He does a very good uh, TED talk, I think, with that. Yeah, is that is that the one where he brought the guy up on stage and then literally took a shirt right off of his back? I think he did or a like, shirt pull, some, yeah. Something with the tie or something like that. That That's incredible. And his but own like, shirt. Yes, yes. But psychology is also a huge part of how mentalism works because mentalism is, is nothing but psychology. Totally. I mean, you saw some of that in jaw droppers with the ashes on the arm thing. I love that trick. 
I love some that of the stuff that happened with that. This woman was just in tears because because the, the, the way that it worked is the trick didn't work the way that we thought it was going to work. It worked mm -hmm. the way that she thought it was working. So we just went with it. Really? What did she think? Well, we were we were thinking that the 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 code name was her daughter. It ended up being her dog that had died. So we just oh. went with it. Oh. And okay. we, let, we let her thinking take us to where we wanted to go with it. <laughs> oh, and you kind of just go along with it and it turns into its own little effect right there. It turned that, into a great. bigger effect because she created it. That was pretty wild. That's great. Pretty cool. That's really cool. <laughs> well, this has been fun, Chris. I'd like to do some more of these things. My uh, oh, thinking for this, this show is to just talk about things like this. And uh, I hope I can keep some momentum with it. I got some other big visualizations, what I want to do with some uh, like conventions and festivals and things. Magic okay. Related. Okay. But, uh, like stay in touch. I, I tune in on TikTok with you here and there and everywhere. Absolutely. And then when this That's is funny. up uh, on YouTube, send me the link and I'll share it. Will do, Buckaroo. So I'm going to sign this one off. I appreciate you taking the time. If you want to, whoops, <laughs> if you want to stick around um, after I turn this thing off, turn off the record, we'll have a little chit chat. Other than that, yeah, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us and uh, appreciate all of you out there. And uh, be good, be safe, and, and make your life magical. Peace.